I have asked the esteem, the esteemed Dr. Gary Wolfram from Hillsdale College, holds the William E. Simon Chair of Economics at Hillsdale College to come on air to discuss what I was talking to a few of you, well, hopefully many of you, right before the uh, end of the hour last uh, hour about trade deals. And generally people would think that trade deals naturally would hurt people. So if we buy more from countries outside of us and sell less, it kind of, kind of goes into the trade deficit, but in the sense that it takes jobs away from Americans because there's countries out there who don't have uh, unions or don't have uh, minimum wages or what have you. And their labor is cheaper, so jobs will leave. I asked him to come on and talk about that and see if it's true or not. As Because as I said before, when it comes to capital gains tax, people would think you raise taxes, more money comes in. Well, the inverse happens. You raise taxes, less money comes in. You lower taxes, more money comes in because of more activity. So which one is it? So welcome back to the Live with Rank Show, Dr. Gary Wolfram, the William E. Simon Chair of Economics at Hillsdale College. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on again. I love our interviews. I always look forward to them, and, and they're always enlightening. Now, you heard what I said as well as yesterday. I sent you the link of the article I was looking at from Jimmy Hoffa, Jr. Uh, and uh, so what you say? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, one is... Trade is between people. There's not trade between countries, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you decide that you want to buy um, an iPhone, okay? And part of that iPhone was made in China or someplace. Um, and you decided that you're willing to give up, you know, whatever an iPhone costs. You know, let's say it's $200 or something. Who knows what it is? I haven't bought one in years, but... Um, but let's say it's five hundred dollars. Okay, um, you decide you give up the five hundred dollars, and Apple says, "Okay, we're willing to trade you this, uh, you know, this iPhone for it." So trade is a voluntary exchange, right? I mean, you're not right. forced to buy stuff. And, you're not and, forced to sell stuff. Right. And and what popped in my head when you said that it's between people is this: so it's actually you who buy those products who are causing the problem that Jimmy Hoffa is complaining about. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't know that there is a problem. I understand, but those in the who... same way, but you're exactly right. Yeah. You are exactly right. When you decide to buy something, you're just exchanging your, you know, your money for whatever good that you're buying. Or when you exchange your labor services, you're exchanging, you know, your time for whatever your employer uh, pays you. So these are all voluntary exchanges. I mean, no one's forced to buy stuff from China. And if, if people in the United States said, you know what, we only want to buy stuff that's completely made in the United States, we could do it. Exactly right. I mean, right. just like Whole Foods will sell you, you know, organically grown kumquats or something. Right. Um, you, you could say, well, gee, I'm willing to pay more for this. And if people decided they wanted to do that, then that's what would happen. You are, you know, that is, see, that's why I love having you here. And my mind bubbles up when you say that's exactly what I thought when you triggered that little simple thought was that it's not between us. Jimmy Hoffa shouldn't be uh, angry at whomever, these trade deals. He should be angry at the people who are purchasing those products. Yeah, I mean, think about this. Well, first of all, I, I, once I taught years and years ago at... Um, University of Michigan Dearborn for a while. Um, did make it? Didn't make it to the big leagues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there was a number of reasons, but anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, you had to put that one in. For those of you who might not caught that, I'm talking about Ann Arbor. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, although two of my kids have gone there, but anyway, um, I, you know, I asked them because a lot of their, a lot of the kids' parents worked in the. Uh, 
you know, automobile factories in the United States, right, in, in Dearborn, right, work for Ford. And I would say, you know what, what if the Japanese, who were the trading partners in those days, I said, what if the Japanese just decided to give every American a new car? We just woke up on Christmas morning and delivered in our front, you know, in our front, uh, front of our house was a brand new car. Would that be a bad thing? And a bunch of them would say, oh, yeah, that would be terrible. And the reason, of course, is because if you made U.S. cars, you don't want everybody else to have a car. Right. But it, for the vast majority of Americans, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, gee, um, no, I don't I'm turning this thing back, right. right? I'm giving this thing back. Right. Thank right. you very much, but I, I don't, I, I, no, I'm too patriotic for that. So what happens is when, you, when, when mm. things are made less expensively somewhere else, um, than they are here, uh, that's an advantage for almost everybody other than the people who make that product. Right. But you if know, you look at the same thing happened in the Underwood typewriter factory, right? I mean, if you were working in the Underwood, Underwood and maybe many of your listeners might not be old enough to remember, but when I went to college, you took a typewriter with you. Mm -hmm. And um, now, you know, now for my younger would, listeners, you may want to explain what a typewriter is. Yeah, really. <laughs> but never um, go, ahead, go ahead. But but you know, and Underwood was the big manufacturer of typewriters. Well, you know, if you worked in Underwood typewriter factory, if you were fifty two years old and somebody invented you know word processing um, and laptop computers and every other thing, you'd say, oh, that was terrible. So it is, in fact, that any time that there is an innovation or any time that there is a trade that makes it less expensive for you to get it from me than from somebody else, then, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to lose because you're getting it less expensive or I'm going to gain if you're getting it less expensive from me and you're going to lose if you're making the thing. So, you know, tra it, you know, capitalism is what uh, has often been called creative destruction. Right. Right. I mean, you innovate, you come up with something and it wipes out the other stuff. And, you know, the, you know, if the buggy whip manufacturers, uh, you know, they had a problem. Um, and so we always yeah, have hey, to for, think let about me give there a, are going to be winners and losers, <clears throat> but in general, trade is 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 better for everybody let, let me give an example to what you just said blockbuster video sure it was huge the sure. guy bought a, a a a team didn't he own one of the florida teams yep. and whatever and now it's gone why because of the age of uh netflix and red red box uh, and what have yep. you that those those storefronts are gone to your point about giving stuff back years ago when i first started in here i used to have a second job and I worked a kiosk at a, a Sam's with the phones. And we're, uh, they were selling phones. Back then, Sam's didn't own it. I think it was Radio Shack. And I would sit there, and I know from what doing this job during the day, how it, the, the unions hated Walmart because it wasn't unionized. And I would just see person after person I'd get in discussion with, oh, yeah, I'm a, they're all union people. A lot, not all, but a bunch of union people walking in. And I used to chuckle to myself. Well, why are you coming to a place that your union hates because they can't unionize it and they want people to make more money at it? And it's because why? You know, Gary, the price. The price is yeah. cheaper. So it's hypocritical uh, to say to to have both of those viewpoints. And that kind of goes back to not only uh, of uh, giving something back, but uh, uh, trade and looking for something cheaper when your own union members look for the cheapest price and will buy outside of American-made and union-made. And there's a lot of misinformation. Look, how many people out there know that over the last 25 years, U.S. manufactured goods for export has increased more than four times? Yeah. In 1990, the U.S. manufactured exports were $329 billion dollars, in 2014, there are $1.4 trillion. So we are increasing our manufactured goods exporting to other countries. But that can't be true because our jobs are leaving. There's no manufacturing <laughs> companies here anymore. But here's why. Because output per hour has increased more than two and a half times in the manufacturing sector since 1987. Well, that's because the man is making those people work harder for less money. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. 
the, the real problem in manufacturing is U.S. federal government regulations, which fall disproportionately on small manufacturers. That's the drag on manufacturing, is all these government regulations, um, and it, uh, the, the, uh, um, the uh, National Manufacturers Association estimates that manufacturers pay almost $20,000 per employee just to comply with federal regulations which is uh, double what it is in other industries. That's where we should be focusing our, our complaint. And this is where discussions about topics like this ought to go. And then you guys can decide by yourselves which way you still think. But did you know what Dr. Wolfram, by the way, Dr. Wolfram from Hillsdale College is, uh, is online with me and we're discussing trade agreements, bad or good. Did you know that the increase in manufacturing happened 400 over 400 percent since what year since 1990 since 1990 uh, did you that's manufactured for export that's how much more we're sending out to other countries it's it just we're buying more for other countries and we're buying more from other countries right and, and also the way the different angles as I, I said the other day I like to present the way I talk about the news of the day and try to give you different perspective and angles on looking at an issue and like Dr. Wolfram just did with us concerning what what why are people mad at these trade agreements they should be mad at the people who are buying the products because we could all buy American made that would shut down the trade deficit immediately. Just all, everybody sit there and say, I'm not willing to pay, I, I, I'm not going to pay $100, uh, I'm, no, I'm not going to pay $300 for that lawnmower, I'm going to pay $800 because I want a mayor, all American made. Right, Dr. And Wolfram? if people really wanted to do that, the, the manufacturers and the retailers would, would know that. You'd, you'd, walk into the, you'd walk into the Walmart and there would be totally made first of all you can't make most of these things totally in the united states I know. but even if you could you know they'd have just like whole foods got organically grown or kroger's got organically grown vegetables and they advertise it and you pay more for it they would put in you know manufactured entirely in the united states and you know maybe, but for clothing you might be able to do it for things like that um and people you know people if people were willing to pay more um some bright entrepreneur would start advertising, you know, made completely in America. So then when I read in this opinion piece by James Hoffa that 57% of Democrats and 55% of Republicans voting in the March 8th primary agreed with the statement, quote, trade with other countries takes away U.S. jobs, end quote. And as I said earlier, yes, when you take words like that and senses like that and just throw it at your everyday person and it just, they'll be hit with, naturally, their first thought. And their first thought was, oh, of course. It's like I said about uh, taxes on capital gains. Uh, oh, yeah, you raise taxes on capital gains, more money will come in. Well, no, in reality, the inverse happens. What? You know, same thing uh, possibly with this. You're going to jump to what comes in your mind automatically, and that is trade with other countries takes away from U.S. jobs. Oh, yeah, I could see that happening. And then he says, those who saw through the unfree fair trade charade propagated by big business overwhelmingly supported the candidates who won in Michigan on both sides. Again, is it big businesses that are doing this or is it big businesses that are trying to meet the needs of their customers? Well, it's, it's part of it's what If we go back to Bass Jot from 1850, you know, we talked about the seen and the unseen, right? You, you know, if you are in Michigan and you see somebody buying a car that was made in, in the old days, made in Japan, um, you'd say, oh, my gosh, uh, somebody must have lost their job. Well, yeah, but you don't see that somebody got a job making the parts for the, uh, you know, for that Japanese car. It was just like when we did steel import quotas. We, we decided, oh, my gosh, there's all these losses in the steel industry, and so we put steel import quotas on, and we made it. So what? It drove up the price of steel in the United States, and more steel workers got hired. But then what happened was all sorts of parts manufacturers in the United States were getting wiped out because they were paying more for steel than, uh, than uh, foreigners were paying for steel. And so the parts manufacturers' were, jobs were being lost. So it, you got it. The, the thing about economics is that not any one piece of it's really difficult. It's just seeing this is connected to this is connected to this. 
Right. And the positive and negative consequences that comes from the policies that we all think we believe in as to better help us. Most people probably think that they're trying to help uh, and that the the policies that they're voting on or for. And, that, and by that, I mean, you vote for a, a party, you vote for their policies <clears throat> that they truly believe that's going to help. But they're not looking at and they're, they're either not given all the positive or the negative consequences from that, or they, you know, Judge Judy's on. I I don't have time to to you know watch the news because Judge Judy's on. And it's it's just a matter of thinking thinking through a little bit and saying, okay, um, what 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 would I be willing to um, to live like if we stopped trading? Imagine that if uh, that. Yes. Well, I'm going to go to break, Dr. Can... Wolfram, so let's hold okay. that. I, and that's right. a great point to, to butt in there and say, let's go to break. What would it, can you repeat that again? Yeah, what, what would our life look like if we only bought things which were manufactured in our little area? That's Dr. Gary Wolfram from Hillsdale College uh, discussing trade, and he'll answer that question for you coming up right after this. You're listening to Live with Rank. We'll be right back. Joining me is Dr. Gary Wolfram. From, did you enjoy that, Dr. Wolfram? Yeah, I mean, it sounded like I used to watch with my kids some uh, some TV show that was had cartoon. It was a cartoon. That's show. That's where it's from. Animalistic or anim, I don't know something like that. I found that, but uh, I like to have fun here once in a while. We're talking about trade, trade with all those countries, and if you can repeat them all to me in the next. Uh, a uh, minute, uh, then uh, I will give you a thousand dollars of monopoly money. Just got to hedge my bet there. Uh, we're talking about trade. This is Dr. Gary Wolfram, as I said, from Hillsdale College, economist, uh, holder of the William E. Simon Chair of Economics there, and often on the show. And I really appreciate it because he really explains things, as you know. Up front. By the way, before I forget, uh, you have a great book. What is that last oh. book you have? You want to? I want you to be able to promote it because I really believe in it. It's called A Capitalist Manifesto. Um, it uh, basically it's understanding the market economy and and defending liberty, and it just basically is a basic oh. explanation of how markets work and why you need uh, limited government to uh, you know t to have markets work and why it's the only system that uh, helps. Uh, helps the poor. Yeah, and so you guys who are out there looking at going on vacation this summer, pick up the Capitalist Manifesto at Amazon.com or yep. Her uh, Hillsdale's site, right? Yep. And you could sit there on the beach and look smart. <laughs> Even Actually, if I'm, working on, I'm, I'm working on another book right now. Um, is capitalism good for the poor? Um, which a lot of people wouldn't know that the answer to that, but, uh, you know, the correct answer is yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, if they listen so, to my show, they'd know because I've often, uh, who, Dr. Milton Freeman spoke about that in the past. Milton Freeman, I mean. Oh, yeah. Well, think about, think about trade, you know, who benefits from having lower priced goods? Who buys these type of goods are the, are the, the poor people, right? right. I mean, they, you know. Right, exactly. And uh, these people, uh, head of these unions who uh, are actually then, you know, in their vernacular, are attacking the poor people because they would want them to pay higher prices. They would say, oh, no, 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 no. Then uh, everybody would have high paying jobs. Not, you know, there's always going to be poor or there's always going to be someone who considers themselves poor or are poor. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you asked a question uh, at the end of the last segment. Uh, can you repeat that and give the. Well, I mean, I was, I was going to make the point that suppose that the only goods and services you could buy were ones that were made in your immediate area. So let's say Hillsdale. I had to, the only thing that I could buy, good or service, was made in uh, Hillsdale County. Um, th my life would be very different uh, because lots and lots of. In fact, if you just look around you today and think about all the th goods and services that you use today, that were that were uh, produced only in um, your county. You'd notice that wow, this is a real problem. I, you know, most of this stuff wasn't produced completely in in my county, and, and so uh, trade benefits everybody. You, you know, some people say we're losing on trade. You can't lose on a trade. Now, it may be that 
the other person gained more than you did. But the fact that you traded, if it's a volunteer exchange, means that both of you got better off. And we could argue about, oh, gee, you know, this person got more better off than I did. Um, but, you know, you can't lose on trade. Good point. So then with all that being said, would you say that these trade deals, NAFTA or the TPP, aren't necessarily bad like many think people think are for the United States? Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at the detail on on these things, and there may be provisions in there that make it more expensive to produce here because of regulation. You know, it, it's really the regulatory problem that I was talking about earlier, that, that you know, that something which reduces the barrier to trade, which says that we have more opportunity to to interact with other folks around the world and to buy their product or to um, have them help produce the product that we're producing. Because uh, uh, I don't have the exact number, but a substantial amount of our imports are actually then used uh, for production here in the United States. So we're not just importing final goods and services. We're importing what's called intermediate goods. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the trade makes it so that we are all going to be wealthier uh, in the long run. Yes, there is creative destruction, right? If I, if I invent, um, you know, if, if I invent uh, Netflix, um, people who are working at Blockbuster are going to be out of business. You know, they're going to lose their job and they might be 56 years old and you know, have been working at Blockbuster for 20 years. Um, but, you know, that's the price of innovation. That's why we're wealthier today than the King of England in 1263. So, well, that's nice to know. So, on, at, on, at the higher level, trade and these trade agreements are not bad for our country. They're, I think I'm hearing you say they're good. There may be things within those trades agreements that you would differ with. That's correct. Uh, that's correct. You know, there there might be things which, um, you know, have and and I would I would look for things that were regulatory. Um, you know, requires people to do X, Y, and Z before they can trade. Now you have some. I mean, c clearly there are um, what's called externality problems. That is, suppose that um, uh, Suppose that you are, uh, you know, I've got a factory and it's located next to uh, a lake and you're putting um, some sort of chemical into the lake uh, di as a discharge when you're making your good. When you are deciding how much of your good to make and looking at the cost of your good, you're not counting the fact that you're reducing the quality of the lake to, far to fishers or whatever. That that's what called economists call externalities. And there's some of that that's going to happen in, uh, in, international, in international trade. Like the Chinese may um, make a product and put, you know, uh, sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere and it drifts over to someplace else. So those are the type of things that, um, that you might want to put in a trade agreement that says, you know, uh, we don't want to be bound by a, um, a certain standard that, that you're not. Um, and, but, but that's, that, that's, you know, a detail in general, in general trade, anything that reduces barriers to trade is going to be better for the, the, the economies in general. Again, you're making something that can now be made cheaper somewhere else. That's bad for you. But you know, Th th that's you know that's true of any innovation. I got gotcha. you. Hey, can you stay over one? I we've got into a, somehow we meandered into a big thing about Social Security, and uh -huh. I've talked about privatization. Might you be able to answer a question on that coming up in the next segment? I probably can. Whether I'll have the right answer or not is a good question. Well, but I'll I can provide an answer. <laughs> I'll determine that. All right, thanks. Okay. Uh, you listen to Live with Frank. One of you sent me in an email, Reggie, on a question on that. We'll ask him that. And also, in the next few minutes, if you have a quick question for Dr. Uh, Wolfram, uh, email me at rank, R-E-N-K, at townsquaremedia.com if you can, and we'll discuss that. Coming up right after this. On air with me is Dr. Gary Wolfram. We called in about the trade deals, and we had two, uh, two really good segments, and I learned some stuff and made my mind... Think of uh, different things, such as trade. Really, the only people who are concerned about these 
trade agreements with other countries, you should not be angry at anybody, not the businesses, anybody else, other than the people who are buying the products from those countries. That's what I got out of it. But I asked Dr. Dr. Wolfram to, if he would be willing to hold on and talk about this social security issue that we kind of meandered into with the tax issue that I started the show off with. And a number of you who have emailed me and called in to say that uh, you are not getting social security for one reason or other. One was Kermit who paid in 36 out of 40 months and he didn't, and he's, they're basically saying, if you want to get your social security, you got to go work for another year to get it. And he's retired. He moved on to the government uh, life where he wasn't paying into social security he was paying into, I think he called it the silver participation, something like that. So, Dr. Wolfram, I received an email, and I don't know if you're able to answer this one or not, about, from one of my listeners. Reggie says, ask Dr. Wolfram about George Bush's efforts to privatize Social Security. What would have happened to that investment? Should Bush's recommendations been enacted? Wouldn't the investor be better off today? Uh, Your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, um, well, first of all, it was Animaniacs was the name of the show. There you go. You Googled it? Uh, no, the, no. Oh. It, just, it just came to me finally. <laughs> yeah, you're right, because that's what my call screener told me earlier when he heard me uh, <laughs> uh, searching for it during one of the breaks. Um, but anyway, yes, the, the, you would certainly have had a better return if you had just invested in the S&P 500 index um, than you're going to get on Social Security. Um, and one of the main problems with social security is that what it really is, is it's taking taxes from people right now and turning around and sending it out to people who are on social security. It's a Ponzi scheme. Now for a long time, social security, um, ran a surplus and that money got spent away on other stuff. Um, and now there's a deficit. Um, but the real problem is that you're basically relying on the future um, that someone's going to pay their taxes to fund your Social Security because what got what you paid into Social Security got spent on other people. And if and if the Social Security had been privatized, then that money would have gone into your account, and you could spend it. Uh, you know, you could take it out. You could give it to your kids. You could, you know, whatever. Um, and that, and, and your return would have been, would have been greater. And you would have known that that's your money as opposed to, um, you know, your money going out to pay for other people. Right. And it could be part of your inheritance onto your exactly descendants. Right. And so what do you say to all these politicians I see out there? I remember, uh, couple senators maybe it was chucky e. schumer was one who said oh there's plenty of money in there there's money in there we're not at a deficit there's not money in social security I well mean, you know what it made me think of when he said that and you just brought it up was uh, that dumb and dumber remember when he had the the briefcase and there's like oh i, I got uh, iou's for everything in there that's what's in there paper right that's what's in there is iou it, it, exactly and it's, right. it's the, the, these politicians are the guys from dumb and dumber Oh, there's plenty. Every amount is uh, is accounted for in there in those IOUs. It's just a, it's just an accounting fiction. Um, they're, they're they're actually they're not what's called non marketable government securities. So the Social Security Administration couldn't turn around. It's not like you if you're holding a ten uh, year Treasury bond, you could go sell it today, even though it's not due for till 2020. Um, you could sell it to me or somebody else, and they'd give you some money for it, and then they would get the money. But this stuff isn't isn't marketable. So the, the, this you know these bonds that are sitting there are just IOUs that can't be sold to somebody else to take it over. And so all that is is it's saying, well, when the year 2020 gets here, um, the U.S. Treasury promises to pay to Social Security, uh, you know, ten thousand dollars. Well, if there was no money there, if there if this IOU didn't exist, you'd have the exact same situation. Did they, did, uh, Social Security would go to Treasury and say, hey, we're short $10,000 in what we're paying out, um, and what would, would Treasury do? They'd either have to sell a bond to somebody else for $10,000, raise taxes by $10,000, or cut spending by $10,000. So it's exactly the same 
uh, whether this IOU sitting there or whether there was no social So it's security. worthless, basically, the IOU. It's an accounting. Right. It's, it's an accounting mechanism. That's One that is. they would put people in prison if a private company did that. Oh, yeah. Probably. Now, real quickly, and we're running out of time, are you for privatization of part or all of Social Security? Well, I would, I, I would privatize it all if I could, but the problem is we kept waiting and waiting and waiting. Like when I was Nick Smith's chief of staff in 95, 96, we had suggested it. Um, but now, and in those days, Social Security was still running a surplus. The problem today is, is that you have to find the money somewhere else. Now, the best place to go for this is the Cato Institute. If you get on their website, it's cato.org. You get on their website, they have really good stuff on privatizing Social Security. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wolfram. I appreciate you coming on. Well, thanks for having me. Good yeah. luck for the rest of your show. Yeah, thanks, man. You have a great day. Capitalist Manifesto is the book you need to pick up. It's not, It's it's. it just explains things just like Dr. Wolfram does on my show here. And you, it will open your eyes to understanding things a little bit better. And you young people, you young guys, you know, you're sitting on a beach somewhere reading that, some beautiful young woman or guy, if you're into that, walk by and think, hey, it's pretty smart. I may have to check this out. You listen to Live with Rank. We'll be right back after this. I hope you learned. I did. I learned something. You listen to Live with Rank. We'll be right back. Oh, uh, well, oh, I didn't finish my thought. Sorry about that. Hope you learned something from the interview with Dr. Wolfram. Uh, I always do.